Before we begin, let me mention that I'm a scholar schooled through the formal education system and trained as a historian at the University of Zambia. That being said, it was at UNSA that I first began diving deeper into the origins and evolution of education in Zambia and soon discovered something was very, very wrong. So after nearly 12 years since I left UNSA and having personally taught in government schools, allow me to give you an overview of this system as unbiased as I can possibly be. Education. You've probably heard this before. Education is the key to a better life. That investment in education pays the best interest. But what if I told you everything you thought you knew about education is a lie? That education is not the solution, but actually the veil that has been put over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Would you believe me? Would you be willing to follow me and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes? Or would you rather stay in Wonderland and stick to what you already know? If your choice is the latter, then I advise that you end the video now. But if you're one of the brave souls that seeks the truth, then without further delay, Let's begin our journey. Let's go. Education. What exactly is it? The word education describes a concept that though too well entrenched to be replaced, still suffers from vagueness and ambiguity. You can think of it as a multi-dimensional concept that can be understood from different perspectives. From the informal education, which involves the life experiences we start at birth, to the chronologically structured and hierarchically graded formal schooling system, education has indeed been omnipresent in every society since the beginning of time. Time to learn has helped a lot, not only the young ones, but even the parents as well. Because our young ones now, we know that they will be better readers. Because without learning, they can't be a better person. But through schools, we know most of them, if they end up even up to university, even college, that will be because of the, where the starting point is. Because the benefits which, which we have learned from the uh, time to learn, they really assisted our young ones to understand what they're supposed to do in life. <gasps> Over the years, it has been widely accepted world over that education leads to greater prosperity, that an elaborate system of education produces perfect individuals with moral and intellectual understanding imparted with the knowledge and skills necessary for economic growth and sustainable development. Thus, in Zambia, since independence, economists, politicians and educationists have established a link between education and national development emphasizing that education is the key to establishing or creating a better society. However, when one considers developments in Zambia's education sector since independence relative to its developmental predicament in the 21st century, it becomes painfully obvious that the formal education system has not delivered on its promise as the driver of economic success and national development. So now the question is, why? The purpose of education is to secure the survival of a people. If your education doesn't give you identity, if your education doesn't show your character, conserve or preserve your civilization, that is not education. I would like to be a lawyer. I would like to be a politician. I would like to be a doctor. Let's begin this chapter by stating the obvious. European colonizers did not bring education to Africa. They and their agents simply introduced a new set of formal education institutions which partly supplemented and partly replaced that which already existed. To be sure, before Africa was colonized, knowledge, skills and attitudes were passed from generation to generation in African societies. Knowledge, skills and attitudes. And one area which served as an important educational vehicle, especially for the young in pre-colonial Africa, was oral literature, which included fables, folk tales, legends, myths, and proverbs. 
Furthermore, most learning in Africa was designed to meet the demands of the whole society through training of its members either as individuals or as groups. This approach fostered cooperation and collaboration among its community members and promoted the perfection of knowledge and skills before it was transmitted to posterity. Essentially, all forms of education in Africa was intended to enable an individual play a useful role in society with the learning process being directly related to the pattern of life and work. Though of course it varied from place to place, if we compare pre-colonial education in different parts of Africa, the following features become apparent. Number one, education had a close link to social life, both in a material and spiritual sense. It was collective in nature and progressively developed in conformity with the successive stages of physical, emotional, and mental development of the learner. Number two, there was no separation of productive activity or any division between manual and intellectual education. Altogether, pre-colonial African education matched the realities of pre-colonial African life and produced well-rounded personalities to fit into that society. This type of education was holistic. Thirdly, and contrary to popular belief, some aspects of African education were indeed formal. That is to say, there was a specific program and a conscious division between teachers and pupils. Formal education in pre-colonial Africa was also directly connected to the purposes of society, just like in formal education. The programs of teaching were restricted to certain periods in the life of every individual, notably the period of initiation or coming of age. As such, many Zambian communities had circumcision and other initiation ceremonies for both males and females. And these were usually preceded by an extensive formal teaching program. Oh, you know, traditional African education was meaningful, unifying, holistic, effective, practical, and relevant. There was no separation between education and the world of life and work. It reached out and educated the whole person and involved the entire community, thereby creating strong human bonds. But with the coming of colonialism came the illusion of the supremacy of Western culture and Western type formal education. And with that illusion came chaos. Why did you choose education? Education is everything. I mean, how can you <laughs> skip <Not. laughs> education? Yeah, there is always this argument, you know. In everything I talk, I do, I say, I, I bring up education because it is the most fundamental aspect of a human being. At the beginning of the age of imperialism, humans found out quickly that certain groups of people could be regarded with contempt and subsequently exploited. And one important tool to facilitate this exploitation was education. One ring to rule them all. Africa the cradle of civilization, yet once known as the Dark Continent. It is said in the 1900s, the infiltration of Western forces during colonialism facilitated the obtrusion of Western knowledge systems into African societies, which essentially undermined African indigenous knowledge and destroyed the zeal in Africans to modernize and improve their own education system. Thus, in Africa, the introduction of Western formal education served as an obstacle to the process of cultural transmission and intergenerational communication. To be sure, formal education in Africa cannot be perfectly understood without first considering the strengths and the intentions of the very forces that conjured it up. For European imperialists in Africa, through agents such as explorers and missionaries, education was seen as a vehicle through which Western culture could be fostered or promoted on the African continent. This arrangement viewed Africans as having little or no knowledge of their own, which meant they had to learn advanced, organized, systematic, and sophisticated skills. The proponents of formal Western education were therefore originally motivated by the desire to provide morally upright and honest Christian clerks, traders, translators, and chiefs. It was also meant to produce Africans who could communicate fluently in the language of their so-called colonial masters. On the other hand, there was deliberate emphasis by the so-called Department of Native Education on widespread elementary education at the expense of secondary schooling. 
This was not surprising as Colonial Office and its eminent advisors were impressed by the apparently mischievous consequences of past educational practices in India and West Africa and were equally agitated by the concept of an educational program adapted and responsive to the needs of the community, a doctrine advanced by the American-sponsored Phelps Stocks Commission. In consequence, from the mid-1920s, the official colonial policy gave unmistakable priority to mass education, to the point where, until 1937, there was not a single document published on education in the colonies dealing with schooling beyond the elementary stage. I think the, the colonial impact was twofold. One was the creation of those states, 53 states created out of 6,000 created by foreigners. Um, Africans had no part in their creation. But the other factor is the, the destruction of belief in Africa, the, the lack of self-confidence, the feeling that we, we can't do it. We studied in history, for instance. All the history in high school, you are focusing everything about Europe. Even if what we talk about Africa, we are talking about the effect of First World War in Africa. Is that about everything we said about Africa is a problem? In short, the nature of colonial education was meant to reinforce the colonial conditions by inculcating the values of the colonial society and training individuals for service of the empire. Further, it promoted the capitalistic system which fed on man's individualistic instinct and induced in the attitude of human inequality and domination of the weak by the strong. The decades of the 1960s and 1970s witnessed drastic quantitative growth in African education system. Policy-wise, racially segregated schools were a cornerstone of the British education policy in Zambia, like anywhere else in the African continent. Therefore, in line with the British policy elsewhere, the education provided was meager both in terms of quality and quantity. The dominant mode of instruction was also rote learning, as opposed to discovery learning, which could have fostered creativity. Now, rote learning is a memorization technique based on repetition. By its very definition, rote learning is devoid of comprehension, and so by itself, it is an ineffective tool in learning any complex subject at advanced level. Moreover, heavy emphasis was equally placed upon primary education. This was consistent with the British colonial policy of allocating Africans exclusively to subordinate positions within the colonial social structure. We have tamed the children. We just want them to write down what we tell them. At the day of exams, they should put down what we have told them. We say you are the best student the country has ever known. That kind of education system is not going to give us critical thinking individuals, especially since we are um, in the 21st century and education 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. I don't care if we get to the point where every African child is in school. If you put all of them in school and do not change the way you teach them, by empowering them to be assertive individuals, you still not transform Africa. You can memorize your way out of poverty. When I'm saying we need to decolonize even education, that is the context I'm coming from. It is further contended that of all the British dependencies in Africa, it was Northern Rhodesia that was the least developed in terms of educational facilities for the given years under colonial rule. Interestingly, while it would seem that in absolute terms, the enrollment figures for both primary and secondary schools rose rapidly between 1957 and 1962, in actual fact, total secondary school enrollments for the given year was below 1% except for 1961 to 1962. More instructively, recurrent expenditure took up the bulk of resources meant for African education, with a huge part of this expenditure going to unusually high salaries for resident and expatriate white teacher. The neglect of African education in Northern Rhodesia was documented by the Economic Survey Mission on Economic Development in Zambia in 1963. The Economic Survey Mission, jointly sponsored by the United Nations, the Economic Commission for Africa, and the Food and Agriculture Organization, could only find 4,420 Africans who had passed the two-year junior secondary school course of Form 2, and only some 361 Zambian Africans with full Cambridge school certificates. It is not an exaggeration, therefore, that when President Kaunda inaugurated the University of Zambia in July 1966, he announced to the nation that at the time of independence, 
1964, Zambia had only 100 graduates, all of them educated outside the country, and no more than 6,000 indigenous citizens with at most two years of secondary education from a population of 3.5 million people. Therefore, to a very large extent, the formal education system in Zambia prior to independence didn't just dole out hand stamps for access to ever-increasing tiers of an oppressive hierarchy, but it played a crucial role in forging and maintaining this system. And while this is certainly not an indictment of everyone that ever worked within the education system, and admittedly, many educators were well-intentioned and some of the most altruistic residents, ultimately, all educators were influenced by the social and political context. Now you'd think the status quo in the education sector would change after independence, right? Wrong. At independence in October 1964, Zambia inherited a racially segregated education system, mega education facilities, low enrollments for Africans, and a heavily liberal arts-based education curriculum. As such, the new political leadership under the United National Independence Party UNEP saw among its most important educational priorities the elimination of racial segregation in schools, increased enrollments for Zambians at secondary and higher education levels, and the introduction of a science-oriented curricula and professional subjects to train Zambians for technical and professional careers. A related problem at independence was the need to reduce the heavy reliance on expatriate teachers, especially at secondary level. In fact, before independence in 1964, there was not a single teacher training institute for secondary school teachers in the country. To be sure, the UNIP Manifesto of 1962 offered a comprehensive statement of the educational objectives that UNIP hoped to pursue on attainment of independence. Outstanding among such objectives were universal primary education for both girls and boys, abolishing of racially segregated schools and increasing educational facilities. It is therefore hardly surprising that both the Transition Development Plan of 1965 and the First National Development Plan of 1966 stressed increased in enrollments at primary level, making the major thrust of the education system in the early post-independence era in Zambia focused on providing primary education for every child aged 7 in Zambia by 1970. However, it was not long before the shortcomings of this approach became apparent. This emphasis on accelerated educational enrollments to furnish manpower requirements by the economy continued during the larger part of the second national development plan between 1972 and 1976. But by the end of 1974, and especially in the early months of 1975, the nation's policy makers discovered that the rapid educational expansions of the previous 10 years had created problems of their own, which required corrective measures. And prominent among these problems were failure by secondary schools to absorb many students enrolled at primary school level, declining quality of education in the face of massive enrollments, and most importantly, lack of preparation of school leavers in the face of the demands of life in the real world after completion of their primary school education. In other words, the government was spending huge sums of money and resources to train Zambians in their masses at primary level. But in the real world, this training was, for lack of a better term, useless. The reason is very simple. Education system has to be practical, African-centered. The colonial education system was created for the new settler governments. The few Africans who became educated in these systems were primarily to aid white settlers, which is why most became cracks and so forth in supporting the roles. Yet, we still use the same education system that oppressed us to educate free people. As teachers, we really get frustrated. Between 1979 and 1983, the Third National Development Plan was primarily intended to implement the aspects of UNIP's educational reforms. However, instead of helping implement, the document simply reaffirmed and emphasized what was already contained in previous reforms. A notable example of this was its stress on self-help and emphasis on the development of science and technology. 
So instead of solving the problems in education, the third national development plan simply restated them. It therefore goes without saying that from the 1976 policy document Education for Development to the Basic Education Subsector Investment Program BASIP of 1998, the government through the Ministry of Education attempted to rectify the nation's complex education and developmental problems with one silver bullet. Mass education. For example, activities within BASIP involved 61% of the expenditures of the 1998 government budget for education. Emphasis was on improving school infrastructure, building capacity in the education system, raising equity, developing better partnerships, and of course, improving quality and coordination in the basic education sector. As such, in 2005, Zambia had over 6,962 basic schools with 2.8 million learners. However, overall, out of all those that enrolled at primary level, less than 2% entered university or other forms of higher education. Looking back at the achievements of the 2006 Fifth National Development Plan against the said goals, yet again, it becomes apparent that basic education took precedence. Furthermore, in an article by Norbert Mlenga of the Times of Zambia dated 24th December 2009, Mlenga admits that with the sixth national development plan in the making, the only identifiable developments in education in terms of higher learning were the putting in place of a policy for readmission of pregnant students and the reservation of 25% of the admission places at the University of Zambia exclusively for girls. Milestone achievements in themselves, but somewhat overshadowed by the dim overall picture of lack of investment in higher education. Fast forward to the present and possibly the future. In the Zambia National Vision 2030, which is a projection of how by 2030 Zambia will be a prosperous middle-income country, the bias towards basic education still persists. According to the vision, Zambians by 2030 aspire to live in a strong and dynamic middle-income industrial nation that provides opportunities for improving the well-being of all, embodying amongst other things social economic justice, democracy, respect for human rights, and having an economy which is competitive, self-sustaining, dynamic, and resilient to any external shocks and free from donor dependency. However, this is to be achieved by increasing the net enrollment rates at basic levels 1 to 9 to 99% by 2030, whilst increasing university and skills training output by only 2% per annum. Though the document can be commended for recognizing the need to diversify the education curricula so as to make it respond to the knowledge, values, attitudes and skills of individuals and society, its final analysis on what really needs to be achieved in the education sector, summed up in the phrase, education for all, is rather vague. Worse still, one of the major criticisms of the literature on education and foreign aid to the education sector in Zambia, like other parts of Africa, is that it is based almost entirely on the motives and objectives of donors, while dedicating little attention to the needs of recipient countries. At this point, one cannot help but notice a pattern forming in the evolution of the education system in Zambia since colonial times. A persistent inconsistency in policy and practice that focuses almost exclusively on elementary education at the expense of higher learning. Alternatively, in iterating this sentiment, former UNSA Chancellor Jacob Mwanza advised that university education be a pillar for the country's attainment of the Vision 2030. Speaking at the 39th UNSA graduation ceremony, Dr. Mwanza maintained that higher education should be the driver of national development in general and in Zambia's Vision 2030. Today, despite African leaders acknowledging the value of higher education and how it is critical for sustainable development on the continent, higher education is still accorded much less priority by governments as well as various international agencies and donor organizations. This approach is premised on the allegedly greater returns on investment in basic education than higher learning. Meanwhile, the practical results of the severe neglect of higher education institutions is a corresponding deterioration of infrastructure, decline in teaching capacity and quality, decline in research activities and productivity, as well as increasing brain drain of academics and researchers. 
This unfortunate predicament, coupled with the effects of political instability, widespread poverty and disease, add up to a situation where higher education institutions in Africa are not only unable to execute their own core functions effectively, but are not in any position to contribute meaningfully to the development of other sectors in a way that would address larger issues of social and economic upliftment, especially in relation to the achievement of national visions and developmental goals. There are still many, many aspects that are based on very colonial theories of learning and teaching that are theories that were developed mainly in Europe more than 100 years ago, a lot of them. There's very little which is referenced to African scholars, thinkers around learning and teaching and how curriculum, there's very little. So things have not changed. <laughs>